um, let's make a start. I'm sorry, but I think it's nice to have a bit of a coffee break, and we'll just run as the program and have a little bit less time for the re reception, but I'm sure it'll all work out fine. Now, people with very sharp eyes will have noticed that that's not Professor Vigota um, <coughs> standing in front of the podium. Um, Elsa van Nievenhauser. Nievenhauser. I knew I'd get this terribly wrong. Uh, has kindly stepped in. Unfortunately, Professor Vigota has uh, got a knee injury and uh, basically can't walk, so um, he has had to um, uh, not do his talk today. But we're very grateful that Elsa has uh, stepped in at the last moment, so mm -hmm. thank you very much. And this session really is about guidelines and sort of different perspectives, because we all do this research and, and hopefully, you know, produce data. Um, but it's a big difference where, when data actually gets taken up and used in national guidelines and actually translates into clinical practice. Uh, and that, uh, the, the time period between you know, producing hopefully good data that may even be a better diagnostic test to implementation can often be many, many years. So um, we've got people talking different perspectives. We have um, a Belgian perspective. We have Sean Kehoe, who's kindly coming from the UK. Misty, who's going to give the United States perspective. And, and Lil is also going to talk about ovarian cancer screening. So it's going to be an interesting session. Um, and I'll hand over to Elsa to talk about a Belgian perspective, I think. So yeah. thank you very much, and thank you for stepping in. Yeah, no problem. So I'll try to gain some time for you as well as I go through the presentation of Professor Vergota. Um, first of all, here in Belgium, we have the Belgian Cancer Registry who um, registers all oncological cases and ovarian cancer cases as well. And as we see in 2004, between 2004 and 2008, uh, we see that of four ovarian cancer patients, only 17% of these women are treated in hospitals that treat more than 20 cases per year. On the other end of the spectrum, more than 70% of patients are treated in 113 hospi Belgian hospitals, in hospitals that treat five cases or less per year. We do not stand alone in this, because if you see to the European uh, patents, which was published in 2010 by Vergoot and Van der Zee, we see that less than 50% of European patients are treated according to protocols and or benefit from the minimum required surgery for ovarian cancer, let alone complete cytoreductive surgery. And clear guidelines or recommendations do matter for the patient. Eh? If we see to characterization of ovarian cancer pathology before surgery, it matters because good imaging, such as ultrasound and CT, MRI, or PET, will help you to improve to select these patients with advanced cancer uh, stages to refer them for good debulking surgery to reference center, and hence will improve their, um, their outcome. That is why the achievements made by IOTA and this IOTA meeting today are of paramount importance. Since there is increasing evidence that centralization or structured oncological care does improve uh, patient outcome, the Belgian Healthcare Knowledge Centre, KCE, published ovarian cancer guidelines in 2016. They basically looked at, at parameters involving diagnosis, treatment, and follow-up of ovarian cancer, and they looked at the existing evidence. So they looked at randomized controlled trials, observational studies that do exist uh, about certain parameters of ovarian cancer, and they discussed it with an expert panel, and they retained uh, a couple of recommendations for ovarian cancer treatment in our country. And IOTA is actually... Uh, Included in these guidelines, one of the recommendations is that we should ex assess a pelvic uh, mass preoperatively using IOTA simple rules or the IOTA logistic regression model, the ADNEX model, um, to actually uh, select our uh, get ovarian cancer patients for debulking surgery or laparoscopic surgery and to actually make a difference between the borderline malignancies and the invasive cancers. They also made some surgical uh, recommendations, such as you should uh, perform a frozen section during surgery to guide your surgery at that moment. They also uh, s uh, state that do not perform lymphadenectomy for borderline ovarian cancer. Uh, consider omitting lymphadenectomy in small uh, stage 1A uh, ovarian cancer cases and stage 1 mucinous tumors of the expensile type, for example. 
also recommendations regarding use of chemotherapy in early stage, no chemotherapy for borderline tumors, uh, etc. You should uh, have uh, a good staging before operating on ovarian cancer patients, so not only ultrasound, but beware, use CT scan, use laparoscopy, or uh, whole body MRI to actually uh, select your patients and not perform a debulking surgery with, pa uh, uh, with patients with unresectable metastases. Other recommendations, of course, we know that residual disease still is one of the most important prognostic factors in ovarian cancer. So you, your surgery should aim to a macroscopically no uh, resection. We prefer prim uh, primary debulking, if you can, in your stage three and four disease, uh, and you only start with new adjuvant chemotherapy in these cases where you have unresectable metastases up front. Do not routinely offer first-line intraperitoneal chemotherapy. That's not what we recommend here in Belgium for advanced stage ovarian cancer patients. Three weekly carboplatinum uh, paclitaxel is a standard, but a bit of uh, emerging evidence that you also can use weekly administration of these products. Um, and do not offer chemotherapy just on the rise of CA125 alone. A couple of recommendations, of course, these are just recommendations and the patient is free to go where she wants to go and the doctors there in that hospital can treat as according as they want to. But also on a European level, there is an ongoing effort to improve quality of care for ovarian cancer patients and ESGO, which is the European Society of Gynecological Oncology, plays a pivotal role in, in this. Uh, what do they do as go? They offer, uh, they promote uh, the training of gynecological surgeons, so they are very trained in, in doing these advanced ovarian cancer patients by uh, um, uh, giving ESGO fellowships, so you can apply to an ESGO fellowship in a an, in an, uh, certified center. They uh, try to improve the average standard of surgical care for ovarian cancer surgery and make a network of certified centers. If you think your, uh, your center uh, does it very well in, in treating ovarian cancer, you can apply for accreditation by ESGO if you think you will meet their criteria and doctors, patients, governments can actually uh, check whether your hospital has the ESGO accreditation. The mindset is not to be punitive, but to motivate the centers to actually gain your accreditation by ESGO. Uh, this accreditation is the responsibility of a special working group within ESGO. Um, these are the members of this working group, so all renowned international specialists uh, in the field of ovarian cancer treatment. And they retained uh, 10 criteria. Uh, for the surgery of ovarian cancer, and they send it out to 92 uh, reviewers, also eight uh, representatives of patient advocacy groups, um, and 10 criteria are uh, retained, and then you can see for your own center whether you meet these criteria at the end. The, just to go briefly over these uh, criteria, you should aim, of course, always aim for complete surgical resections, but there are cases where you just can't get the, the R0 resection, but your center should, from all your advanced cancer patients, should at least achieve more than 65% of complete cytoreduction. Also, the primary debulking rate should be more than 50% of all your advanced uh, ovarian cancer patients. We know that numbers in oncology do matter, and your experience, your expertise will grow if you, have, if you treat more numbers of patients. So your surgery of your ovarian cancer patients, stage three, three to four, should be performed in centers and by surgeons that at least treat a respectable number of patients. And then it's a question, what is a respectable number of, of patients? There have been more and more publications where you see that the overall survival um, improves uh, when a surgeon has more cases done yearly. 
and in 2010, uh, Brislow published in Gynecological Oncology a nice uh, series of patients, more than 45,000 patients, uh, stage three and four, where they clearly see a correlation between a number of cases. So if a surgeon operates more than 21 cases yearly, they saw a significant improvement uh, in the overall survival of, of patients. Um, the ESGO statement is a bit more mild, and they say that you should at least more than 95% uh, uh, of surgeries should be done by surgeons that have at least 10 cases uh, a year. Also, who operates m matters. Andreas Dubois published in Gynecological Oncology that the overall survival improves when the surgery is done by a gynecological oncologist, so somebody who is trained in these advanced case, cases um, versus a surgeon or a gynecologist who is not actually trained in this, uh, in this field. Also, he, his group and uh, the group of Robinson saw that uh, centers participating in clinical trials also have a more improved survival for their ovarian advanced ovarian cancer patients. Criterion number five is that you're, you, you do not stand alone as a surgeon. We need the expertise of our radiologists, our nuclearists, our pathologists as well. And you should discuss uh, every patient with these specialties in a multidisciplinary meeting preoperatively. Um, actually, also a nice, uh, nice publication now in 2016 uh, from a Swedish group where they, s they have seen an improved survival of their patients uh, after 2011. What happened there? Before 2011, they did not have centralized oncological care for this ovarian cancer pathology. After 2011, they did. And uh, as you can see, you have an, a nice uh, in increase in overall survival just by by centralizing the oncological care. This is not only the surgeon that gains more, gain more expertise, but also your pathologist and your radiologist, your ultrasound people, of course. So that's uh, important as well. You, have, you ha need to have a required preoperative workup, so you can't just start operating blindly. You, you need to have good imaging uh, beforehand just to know whether you have unresectable disease or not before you start your surgery, and you can rule that out by imaging all and all laparoscopy. Also, your team from anesthetists and your, uh, your um, nurses, your uh, dietists, everyone in the, in the medical field or paramedical field should be, be acquainted uh, in the treatment of ovarian cancer. So not only the surgeon, not only the pathologist, etc., but also your uh, entire team should be able to manage these patients pre, intra and post operatively. You should, you should uh, report on your surgery and there are minimum of required elements that should be in the report. Uh, where is the disease spread? How large is it? Are you able to resect everything? And if you're not able to resect everything, what is the reason why you can't, res can't achieve complete cytoreduction? reduction? And this is not only true for the surgical report. This is an example for ESCO, what a surgical report can, can look like. So you just need to cross, uh, the, tick the boxes. Uh, for where the tumor involvement uh, actually is. So that's a very nice uh, example. But also the path pathological uh, reports needs a minimum of uh, required, required elements. Uh, there we are helped by the International Collaboration on Cancer Reporting Histopathological Guide that sums up the, the minimal elements that need to be in the pathological reports. And last but not least, uh, you perform surgery. If you have complications, you need to report that honestly in a structure, uh, structured manner. You need to discuss it in team, what, what happened, what can we do to prevent it. Um, and you need to keep track if you have a high complication rate so you can actually see why this is, happen, is happened and, and, and improve your surgical outcome. So then you can score your, your, your own center. And if you have more than 28 out of 40 points, you can apply for ESCO accreditation. And then you get a nice uh, uh, certificate. Is there anything else beyond uh, the ESCO accreditation? 
uh, ESCO also has centers of excellence. Of course, excellence, of course, these are centers that are accredited by ESCO. They treat more than 50 cases per year. They are PIs in important clinical studies. They have a biobank and a laboratory in basic and translational research, and they have accredited ESCO fellowship. Their role is, of course, to host visitors to come and have a look how, how we work. They have a running database to share with the other centers, the organized teaching and providing material for ESCO uh, E Academy. And then to conclude, I think this is a nice plea for actually structured or uh, centralized oncological care. It's a, a letter from a Danish uh, patient who, who states that as a patient, ovarian cancer stage 3C patient, um, that at the time she was diagnosed in 2001 in her country, 32 hospitals were allowed to perform uh, surgery for ovarian cancer, uh, regardless that they only had 600 patients per year in, that, in, that, in, their, in her country. And since a couple of years has been changed, they're down to four uh, hospitals, and she as a patient thinks that that's an improvement because she wants to go as well to, to a center that has the... the the, the expertise needed uh, to, to treat the, the patients and that the surgeons are tr uh, uh, training their skills regularly. So I think it's, it's a nice uh, plea for more and more guidelines and structured oncological care so we still have some improvement uh, to make. I thank you for your attention. <laughs> Um, thank you very much. What I'm going to suggest is that um, we don't take questions on your talk and they'll, we'll sort of have people talk about the guidelines and then if you take a seat on one of the red chairs, we can then um, perhaps discuss relative differences between guidelines if there are some that exist um, between all of you. Would that be okay with you? Slight problem and I still have clinical... Uh... You have to go. So you're, you've a good excuse. It's not only this, I'm, uh, I'm uh, replacing Professor Verhoeven today, so I'm a bit... Uh... Ah, okay. Well, in that case, go and do some clinical work, and thank you very much. Thank you. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay, so um, now it's my pleasure to introduce Sean Kehoe. Sean is... Um, Professor of Gynecological Cancer at the University of Birmingham in the UK and also in Oxford, and he's... Uh, uh, highly uh, involved in a number of committees, uh, National Cancer Intelligence Network in the, in the UK and also in FIGO, so obviously has a very good, uh, is in a very good position to look at uh, all guidelines actually around the world. But uh, today um, he's going to talk about um, Green Top Guideline from the Royal College of Obstetrics and Gynecology in, in the UK and, and in relation to ovarian cancer. Sean, thank you very much for coming to Leuven. Thank you. Thank, you. thank you very much, Tom. Um, sorry about that. Should I stay across there? No, no, I'm okay here. Okay, thank you very much. It's a delight to be here. I don't think I've ever spoken here, and it's really excellent to see so many people at this very important meeting. And I'm going to talk to you today about the OCOG guidelines. That's our Royal College, which is an international college. More of our members are outside the UK than they're inside, and we run into tens of thousands of people. We're a relatively young college as well. Um, and I'll go through some things about what we do. As part of the college's duty, we undertake reviews of care of practice and make sure it's evidence-based and produce what we call the Green Top Guidelines, which have been around for over 30 years. And the systems that are employed in that is somewhat looking at, I would call it more a literature review rather than a systematic review, because they cost quite a lot of money. A proper systematic review will cost you uh, £60,000, which is whatever, depends on the day, doesn't it? It's either 80,000 or 70,000 euro, but a lot of money. Uh, therefore, it's a good literature review drawing on all the information that's available. A group of experts are brought together to make the review happen and then it is sent out to another group of experts to peer review what's been written. And that's how we develop our green top guidelines. The evidence base is the classic uh, systems that we all know, either you go from level one to four, or the ABCD mechanisms. Both of them, of course, as we know, uh, in the skeleton are, are very, very similar. We also have people who peer review them. I suppose conflict of interest come in here, but as you can see, 
Tom was one of the reviewers for this Green Top Guidelines, as I was, and indeed IOTA was also incorporated. So it's not a very local kind of a system. We will draw on anybody and everybody who's involved in a similar area and gain information and reviews from them and take on board their comments also. I think from the previous speakers, worth knowing a little bit about the NHS. Everything ESCO is doing, we started it in 1995, where we centralised care. But it's also important to understand when you look at the UK and the English thing, maybe you should understand a little bit more about what we are, because we heard the previous speaker say, the doctor can do what they like when the patient comes in. We're slightly different to that. And the patient can go where they're like, which theoretically in the UK you can do, in practice it's slightly different. It's worth noting that we're the, normally it was the fourth biggest employer in the world. So 10% of the workforce in the UK is associated with the NHS or employed by them. This is when I got down from the United States. And one thing about the Americans is they don't like the fact that they're not on top. And it's the first time I've seen that apparently they employ more people in the armed forces, in the US Department of Defense, which should make us all panic when you consider their new president. Having said that, we normally were on number four. Walmart, I knew, had taken over, but McDonald's, I'm not sure if they do actually employ more than the NHS. So it's a huge organization, and big organizations like big, big tanks are very slow to move and maneuver, and you need to appreciate that. The other thing are the pressures under this system. As you can see here on the left-hand side, <coughs> beg your pardon, up here, this purple is the amount of GDP spent in the NHS. It's the most cost-effective health service in the world and has been consistently that for decades. And cost-effective, unfortunately, means that our cost, we don't spend very much money relative to the European countries on our health service. People like me disagree with that, actually, and think it's wrong and that we should be spending more. But the reality is that's what we do. And therefore, per head of capita, we're spending much less. And the other thing that's important for us to know in terms of today is the fact that when we ran the screening study there, looking for early ovarian cancer, the biggest issue we had were ultrasonographers. It's a huge, big problem for us, getting ultrasonographers. We also have our own green guidelines, but we've got this group as well, called NICE. And what NICE will do is dictate what you're going to manage with that these are the criteria that you use, and the people with the money for the NHS will use those criteria. A good example would be, nice review ultrasound for ovarian cysts. IOTA is not to be used because our evidence base is insufficient. End of. There is no money to do IOTA except within the context of research. So if you find some frustrations with us, you need to understand that's what we're up against. And in, sometimes it is very, very frustrating. But I thought I'd explain that a little bit to you. And these are the ovarian cancer NICE guidance with regards to the management of patients. So the people who are buying the service, they will look at this. I can say what I like and say, we really should do this, we really should do that. They'll say, we're bringing in non-biased people and this is what we're deciding on. And it's just to give you an idea of what happens with our patients this is what happens in primary care. The system means that anybody who is ill, non-emergency, go to their own doctor. And that controls the flow of patients. And they will have the CA125 done, depending on the result. We'll move on. Ideally, the next one is normally an ultrasound scan. And if you have ovarian cancer, basically, that's the system you're going to go through. You go to your GP. You then have your ultrasound CA125. Consideration is it might be ovarian cancer. You have a rapid access two-week wait, which is now going to become, not by terminology, but in practical ways, a one-week wait in the next few years. You then go to the local hospital, which may be a gynecological cancer unit. And then as we work through and find it looks like you are an ovarian cancer, you head into the cancer center. So what was talked about earlier about centers and recognition by ESCO centres, we've had those since 1995. And the systems that we've had is a unit, district hospital, 
will refer into a centre. The centre is a catchment area of one million persons. Where I work and with some of the bigger places, it's about two million persons that we have with three or four units referring in. And I think we are going to move ahead, irrespective of what government says, probably into the regional centre and have a few of those around the UK for the very rare operations. But that's the, that's the way we function. We also have a few things that are worth knowing is we have regions which relate to care for health and they can have slight differences which is not meant to happen. But the biggest thing pertinent to this talk is that we also have these things happening here. I'm from down this grey area here, that's where I derive from as the Republic of Ireland and this part here is part of the UK. This, this and this have health services but their governments, in inverted commas, are slightly different and they will make different decisions. Wales and England tend to combine together for a lot of decision making. Scotland will do its own thing and you'll see why I've mentioned that in a little while. It's great fun this. Can you imagine this with Brexit? You see they want to stay, they want to stay, these want to go. It's fantastic fun. I, do, I come from here so I just watch all of this with amusement to say the least. Here we are, the management of postmenopausal cysts came out last year. It's okayed by NICE, probably should note that there. They're happy enough, they've given accreditation to it. That's important. That's important for the GPs who buy actually the service. We don't need to go through this. It's the pathway of the patient and what you should do in various uh, uh, situations. Essentially, these are the new additions that have been brought in. Kind of sad this, I thought, Maybe it's a sign of where we're going in medicine, which bothers me, but they decided, and these are people who now are doctors for some years, that they should put in that you should do a thorough medical history. I felt deeply saddened that I had to be written in to remind a qualified doctor to take a medical history. More importantly probably was they're bringing the family history in the forefront, which is a good thing, because we do forget sometimes to take the family history. So that's brought into the forefront. Appropriate tests should be carried out. There we are, full physical examination should be done. These are basics, but it's sad to see they have to do, they feel they have to do that. The CA125 definitely stays there in this uh, study, or in this recommendation. We're not shifting to anywhere else. There is a recognition, a lot of work being done on other markers, but at this moment in time, according to the college, there is insufficient evidence for them to be brought into clinical practice. They will happily say okay to trials, but that's it, end of. And therefore, they will not be both in the NHS. You're not going to crack the NHS uh, very quickly if you have that. The guidelines, by the way, of the uh, RCOG were undertaken by people from Scotland. Oh, here's the politics now, guys. Scotland have their own guidelines. And I just want to point out, which is fine, and they use a score for referral on for ovarian cancer of greater than 200, or am I greater than 200? Which or am I should be used, and that's where things became fun. It's decided by the uh, RCOG that they would use and recommend an or am I of 200, recognizing also that there's a threshold of 250, which could be acceptable. And the reason you have this, what's going on, is that this, sorry, this recommendation is the nice recommendation. So England and Wales will use that, and the Scots use 200. So if you ever do read them and wonder what's going on here, that's what happened. So when you're doing a review, as I did say to the college, Tom may have well re reported back on this, I said, you've invited Scots to come and look and make this report, which is absolutely fine. However, they've already said they're sticking with 200. Why do you ask people to change, the, you can't ask them to change their minds. They have to have the right to write that down. So they have to write both down. The rest of this is pretty much how we practice clinically. Uh, there is a, as I say, a rec there was a recognition there, an acknowledgement that some centres will use 250 as a cutoff, and they really did have to say that. If NICE says it, it's very difficult to go against that. You end up in quite a quagmire. Uh, the OVA1 system was also looked at as a scoring system. As they say, it is an alternative, sorry, the international IOIS one was looked at. It is an alternative they say at the moment, good sensitivity, but you need scanners who are experienced in this. And we'll come to that again and I'll explain where IOTA really stands. The OVA1 uh, decided this isn't practical for the NHS. We're not going to be able to bring this in. 
we're not doing it. Good level of evidence, there's nothing wrong with that, but it will not come in. The Roma, yes, good level of evidence for its use, but at the time of writing this guideline, Roma utilization in routine clinical practice setting requires further evaluation. So what they're saying here is, it's a possibility that this might come in, but we're not content. We want an awful lot of more information to come back in. So we're still sticking with the old system at the moment, and this is the reason we're not moving. And of course, they have mentioned IOTA. They do give, as you notice, a little bit more detail. Whether that's Tom's influence, I don't know. Probably not, actually. They tend to operate the opposite way. But if you notice here, they say, data is emerging, and it cannot be recommended for routine clinical use as yet. So that puts you a step closer. So they're saying, we know there's more coming, we're watching this, uh, and you're not off the line. So you've got comments about IOTA saying, this is as good as, remember we need the experienced ultrasonographers, which is his problem for us, and there's more coming, so you're close. Now, I think for somebody you know, in the IOTA group, and we have collaborative work with these people, by the way, is that if you crack the NHS, you've got a massive, massive group of people there. It is very big. When it makes its move, that ship, when it does change, it's very, very big. It's not a small thing, it's a huge, huge thing. They've also come forward regarding simple system based on Ian Jacobs' work on the screening program was possible to make some final statements because we got so fed up. What you do is a simple ovarian cyst in a postmenopausal woman who's in her 70s, etc., etc. et, cetera, et cetera. Everybody knows it was all okay. She did have the MRI original scan done because she hurt her back and there you're stuck with this simple cyst. So they've come down and said asymptomatic, simple unilateral, unilocular cysts, less than five centimeters. The risk is so low talk with the patient, do another scan if you so wish, and then if everything's okay, hasn't changed, discharge them. So there are patients that we previously operated on maybe 10, 15 years ago that we may well pull back from at the moment. Importantly is also what happens in the future, and the reason I put this up is to remind myself is that's what we are doing in a collaborative way, is looking at the optimum or MI threshold. When a woman comes in with a cyst, is it benign, is it malignant? That's probably really the work for the future in the sense of how can we stop operating on women who are asymptomatic, they have a cyst, we're taking it out because it's there, they're very well and it's benign and probably doesn't need to be taken out. And we're doing a study with IOTA called Rockets trying to hopefully help that happen in a better way. And the NHS is the right place to test that out, although as you all probably experience in trials, recruitment is always very challenging, but we'll get there at some stage. And they're the kind of things that need to be done in the future because I'm convinced that's where ultrasound is going to really stay in the future. We've heard all about screening studies and I think most of us know that if you screen a metastasis from a primary tumor, when most of these guys are actually fallopian tube tumors, we're probably not gonna make it with screening, unfortunately. I hopefully am wrong on that, but I think that's where it goes. So that's our, a little run through. If you want to read through all of this, if you're that way inclined, you can get everything on the internet, it's open to the public, but uh, I thought that's a little resume of what's happening with the RCOG, which does it, if you like, reflect what's happening in the UK as well in its present form. So thank you very much for your time, thank you. Okay, great. Thank you very much, um, Sean. As I said, I think what we we'll, questions, or do you want? Um, all okay. I suggest is grab a seat and then, or sit down and then come back up, and we'll have a sort of little yeah. round table discussion comparing um, different approaches because we now have uh, Misty um, Blanchett Porter, who from the United States and uh, from Dartmouth uh, University in the States, and she's also, I still, I think, lead for gynecological imaging or uh, ultrasound at the AIUM, the American Institute of Ultrasound and Medicine. So. Um, we've heard from Sean, and I think some people who work in IOTA or in some countries will be, I think, uh, quite amazed by the guidelines in the UK uh, and the approach that's taken. Um, it's, uh, it's a kind of different world, and I think it's interesting for, the, for you to kind of see the environment that you're working with. Um, it's uh, frustrating, but having said that, there are things going on, and people, you know, for example, um, in London where... Um, all sonographers generally are being trained in IOTA rules. In fact, there's a move to do that, irrespective of what NICE and the college says. So you know, people actually do just say, this is silly. 
Um, so we're going to hear what happens in the States, and then I think what we're going to try and do is maybe get Dirk as well and get Misty and Sean to sort of, to, we can discuss um, the differences and if there is a way forward or what we should be encouraging any kind of changes. So Misty, thank you for coming all the way over. Misty's been involved in EOTA for a long time. So uh, great to have you here again. Thank you. Well, thank you to the IOTA group for the invitation. I am really um, pleased and privileged to be here today. And I'd like to go over for the next several minutes the American approach to the adnexal mass and suggest to you that we're trying to move into a direction to come up with a uniform triage pattern, but currently um, we, don't, we haven't quite met that goal yet. Uh, but there's been important work done in the last couple of years to move Americans in the, 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 that direction. So what are the elements of the American voice? The American College of OBGYN was founded in 1951 and is an organization of roughly 58,000 obstetrician gynecologists across the United States and in the U.S. territory. And in the American College of OBGYN, there are 30 different subcommittees that set the standard for practice Sorry. <laughs> practice within the United States. There's the GYN Practice Committee and the Committee Opinions. Sitting at the table at ACOG are members of the American Institute of Ultrasound and Medicine, the Society for GYN Oncology, and the National Cancer Institute. Their decisions and committee opinions are informed, again, with a review of the literature but I would say that many of these committee opinions are actually handed to a group of individuals to be written and then reviewed. So it's not particularly focused just on systematic review, but also allows some interpretation on the individuals who are writing the practice bulletins. Informing the committee opinions include the work done at the University of Kentucky, and I'm pleased to say IOTA now, as you'll see. There are research trials that are done in Providence, Rhode Island at Brown University, um, looking at the utilization of Broma. And now uh, OVA2, or the multivariate index assay, the second generation that's done on the University of Texas. So I'd like to say we're moving to a blended voice with the Americans, but we yet still have work to do there. In fact, Steve Goldstein said to me, to me, you can say what we're trying to do, but we're not quite there yet. So we have similar problems in the United States, is that many of the patients who have ovarian cancer are operated on in the community, either because the mass is not recognized to be ovarian cancer, or the um, individual presents acutely uh, with pelvic pain and is, ends up in the operating room and is incompletely staged. So if you look in the United States, appropriate surgical staging is only performed roughly 52% of the time by general obstetricians and gynecologists and roughly 35% of the time in, in the hands of general surgeons, where it's 97% by gynecologists. So what is the magnitude of the issue? Well, roughly, if you look at a, a review paper that was published in, in GYN Oncology in 2002 in the state of Utah, only 39% of patients with the ultimate diagnosis of ovarian cancer were ever first seen by a GYN oncologist, meaning they were referred for care after their surgical diagnosis. Risk for non-referral were young premenopausal patients with with masses that were not recognized as ovarian cancer. Women over the age of 70 who may have had some difficulty in transport to those organizations. And again, surgery done in very rural locations. And one thing that I want to mention is that in the United States, we have a vast diversity in the care that's performed in ultrasound. So to have your unit accredited by AIUM, you have to submit images and you have to go through protocols but each individual who was, who was certified to work in an AIUM approved institution has only has to do 300 uh, image, uh, images, imaging studies and training, 
which is really different than a, a large majority of, of uh, institutions. And then you only have to do another 150 a year. So you can have very limited scanning and, and, and training and then go out, have an ultrasound machine, and set up to, to triage patients. So ACOG is really interested in addressing the overall global delivery of care for the general OBGYN and providing some guidance there. So you'll see with the ACOG practice bulletin that the guidance is really quite general. In 2016, the practice bulletin committee revised the practice um, bulletin on the evaluation and management of adnexal masses. They reaffirmed that transvaginal ultrasound should be the primary imaging modality, but only gave very general guidance with regards to what morphologic characteristics are consistent with ovarian cancer meaning the guidance was if you have a cystic mass greater than 10 centimeters with populations or excrescences, if you have ascites, then you should strongly consider that this individual may have ovarian cancer. That color Doppler is helpful, although they did say looking at resistive index is not particularly helpful, but that perhaps and I'd like to suggest <laughs> that the IOTA color score will become more important as we go on. Um, but that turn it on that it may actually be helpful in distinguishing between masses that are more benign from those that are malignant. CAT scan, MRI, and PET scan is not first line, so we have difficulty in the United States with spending an awful lot of money in the triage of patients. So the American Cancer Institute and the Centers for Disease Control track the number of cases in the United States of ovarian cancer. We spend $5 billion on the diagnosis and treatment of both benign and malignant <coughs> ovarian masses, 2 to $3 billion a year on the treatment of ovarian cancer. There's roughly 22,000 new cases of ovarian cancer in the United States annually with 14,000 deaths. And at any one point, there's roughly 200,000 individuals who are receiving care for ovarian cancer in the United States. So it's a, a huge amount of healthcare dollars that are spent um, for adnexal masses. The goal is really to get individuals who can be treated conservatively with observation to, to be treated in an appropriate manner, but to triage individuals with ovarian cancer into high volume centers, which I've shown you is a problem for us as well. The American College was descriptive and not particularly directive with the use of biomarkers and multimodality testing, meaning it tended to weigh more heavily in the postmenopausal mass of checking a CA125, but if I were to try and order a CA125, I need to be willing to diagnose the patient if they're part of the Medicare population in the United States with ovarian cancer. So just in the evaluation of an adnexal mass, I can't order a CA125 CA without the risk of the patient having to pay for it out of pocket if I can't give them a diagnosis of ovarian cancer. There's a lot of challenges in the Medicare population. They briefly describe HE4, Roma, the multivariate index assay, and RMI, but they're not directive in terms of its use. ACOG did kind of change their, par their paradigm with regards to the simple ovarian cyst because of the risk of misinterpretation of the guidelines. So, in 2015, they said, with the exception of the simple ovarian cyst on transvaginal ultrasound finding, most pelvic masses in postmenopausal women will require surgical intervention. And the concern there is, is it was interpreted as a postmenopausal patient with an adnexal mass most likely should go to surgery. In 2016, they really changed their guidance to more strongly suggest that simple cysts up to 10 centimeters in diameter with a good quality transvaginal scan performed by an experienced sonographer are likely benign and may be safely monitored without surgical intervention. And we know from the prostate, lung, um, colon, and ovarian cancer trial 
that when patients went to surgery, the complication rate was as high as 15% with marked increase in morbidity. So we're trying to shift away from surgically treating uh, the simple ovarian cyst in a well-done scan to observation. I was very pleased to see this, <laughs> which is that ACOG now is recognizing that there has been significant research on ultrasound scoring systems alone or in combination with serum markers, utilizing historic information for predicting malignancy. And they dedicated two paragraphs to IOTA, looking at the IOTA group's models of LR2 and simple rules. And if you look at the bottom paragraph there, it talks about the systematic review and meta-analysis that was done that shows the highest sensitivity and specificity based on pooled data. So this is new. There's two whole paragraphs dedicated to IOTA, and so I think we are <laughs> breaking the curve here, um, which is important in terms of recognition of the body of work that you all have done so long and so well. So our problem is trying to take patients who are in the hands of the general gynecologist and to give them the tools to be able to triage patients to uh, masses that are most likely benign, to those that require referral to a high volume GYN oncology base. And so I can say now that the University of Kentucky, AIUM guidelines, IOTA, and ACOG are all having some influence in the practice of general gynecology. They're more directive in terms of looking at CA125 and the postmenopausal mass and make note of ROMA and, and uh, the OVA1 work done. I don't know why my slides are off, I'm sorry. Um, in terms of looking at biomarker panels, they're not particularly directive with regards to its use, but they make note because a large body of work on ROMA and now ROMA2 has been done at Brown University in women and infants and multiple research studies. And ROMA includes morphology, menopausal status, CA125 and the use of HE4. ROMA2, the app um, and assessment tool is being revised and reworked currently to, to look at um, patients who are very elderly and those with decreased renal clearance so that you have a more accurate assessment with ROMA2. And the multivariate um, index assay is now in its second generation and also includes some physician assessment out of the University of Texas and now multi-institutional. So I'm going to step back and just talk about whether the general guidance, again, we're trying to provide guidance for a large number of general OBGYNs um, throughout the, the United States. And there are a couple of different themes that become particularly important. The first is ovarian conservation and fertility preservation. It's not uncommon for an adnexal mass to present in a premenopausal patient, the patient to have an adnexectomy rather than a cystectomy or conservative surgery. And as I'm a reproductive endocrinologist is the other um, hat that I wear, and so that kind of makes my hackles go up a little bit when I, <laughs> when I learned about that in our own organization. But it's really a strong statement saying in premenopausal patients and in adolescents, ovarian conservation and fertility preservation is the goal. That benign masses can be observed. When I was a fellow many years ago, endometriomas above a certain size automatically went to the operating room, even in the asymptomatic patient, because of the, risk, the, the concern about torsion or, de or developing symptoms. And now we just plainly don't practice that way. That when a patient presents with adnexal torsion, consider reduction of the torsion assessment of the mass with a cystectomy rather than oophorectomy. And that aspiration of masses should be reserved for those who failed antibiotic therapy with, tum with tumor ovarian abscesses and in th the presence of cancer only to help the GYN oncologist um, plan for neoadjuvant therapy. So in terms of adnexal masses of pregnancy, again, in the United States for many years, once you got to the second trimester, if you had any complexity to the mass, there was a recommendation to go for laparoscopic surgery. ACOG now is strongly suggesting expected management, understanding that many of these masses will resolve, that acute complications are, 
are quite low in terms of rates, and that the majority are benign etiology with a low likelihood of malignancy, and that intervention is based on symptoms, particularly large masses. And it cautions not to use CA125 in pregnancy because not all general gynecologists are aware that in the first trimester you can have quite elevated CA125 levels. In terms of consultation with a G1 oncologist, the guidelines are actually relatively loose. <laughs> Women with an elevated CA125 above 35 and also have symptoms of malignancy and evidence on exam or elevated score on a formal risk should be with a G1 oncologist. And they left it as a, quote, very elevated CA125 in the premenopausal patient. And that was by expert opinion only. In the past, they set a level above 200. But we all know over the overlap with the um, benign lesions and benign etiologies. So I know that you're going to have a, dis a talk very quickly in terms of um, ovarian cancer screening programs, but I just wanted to bring up the University of Kentucky because they have quite a bit of influence and have written quite a lot in the United States. And one of my former residents is now on faculty there and is a uh, principal there. So I had an opportunity to check in with her before I came to see where the state of the state is in Kentucky. And in the University of Kentucky has a very large population of women they're following. It's been almost 24 years now. Their patient population is asymptomatic women greater than the age of 50, and those with a family history of ovarian cancer over the age of 25. They have roughly 22,000 scans now at this point, and I'm not going to cover the, the, what their findings were. But I did well mention um, the University of Kentucky's morphology index. So they have designed and have been utilizing the morphology index with the scoring system of 0 to 10, with a score given for volume of 0 to 5 and a score given for tumor structure. And then to describe each aspect of, this, of the tumor structure, they do make ready acknowledgement that tumor structure is twice as important as tumor volume. And then they've gone and defined with what you need in terms of tumor morphology to meet each score. For them, a positive screen is anyone who has a um, ovarian volume greater than 10 milliliters in a postmenopausal patient, 20 milliliters in a premenopausal patient, a cystic tumor with solid component or papillary projections. And more recently, they have been really interested in looking at the change in morphology in short intervals, something they're calling the delta MI. A little bit about the University of Kentucky. So they're a referral-based a referral -based GYN oncology service, but they are all very highly trained sonographers with really good equipment. And they send those sonographers and that equipment out to very rural locations to make sure that they're getting the best imaging they possibly can get. They recently published a study looking at pro approximately 6,800 masses, of which 5,700 resolved. And then they look at, looked at the change in morphology, something they're calling the delta MI, in the patient population that went to surgery. They scan every four weeks to look for change in the morphology. And they have said in the patients with malignancy, the change has been approximately 1.6 per month. Um, for benign tumors, they're usually stable. And for those are going to resolve, they usually have a negative delta MI. So this is their current triage. Again, they're highlighting unilocular. And then thin septated masses can just be followed. They make the recommendation of surveillance every 12 months for five years, but they fully admit that's expert opinion and not based on data. If they identify someone with a complex or solid mass, they undergo official morphology indexing and CA125. The low-risk masses are followed with repeat ultrasound. The high-risk masses automatically go on to surgery with a GYN oncologist, and they describe that as a MI greater than 5. And then I asked my colleague about this intermediate risk group that get repeat um, delta MI every four weeks for three times NCA125s. And I asked her, because I think there's very, a lot of similarities with IOTA and how they manage masses, I asked her, 
when you look at the Delta MI, are you going based on your gestalt, an expert opinion, or what are you doing there? And she said, good question. It's probably more expert view of those masses. And then I'll turn color Doppler on and look at the flow. So there seem to be a lot of similarities to me. I want to switch a little bit and talk about the AIUM consensus conference that was held in 2014, in which Drs. Timmerman and Dr. Bourne were part of the, the consensus conference panel. There were gynecologists, G1 oncologists, pathologists, and radiologists from Europe, Canada, and the United States. And it was recognized in the United States there are 9.1 surgeries per malignancy compared to in IOTA 2.3 surgeries in oncology centers and 5.9 in other centers. So the aim or goals for this panel was really to look at the state of the science in the, in the evaluation of the adnexal mass and somehow translate it into that in, into better education and steps to improve care for women with adnexal masses. So the goals were to decrease unnecessary surgery, improve referral rates to oncology centers for suspected masses, and provide next steps for the indeterminate mass. So as Dr. Timmerman alluded to, we, we, we're a little resistant to change sometimes, so two approaches were suggested. The first was a simple risk stratification based on pattern recognition, placing masses into three categories, meaning almost certainly benign, that can be followed conservative, um, those that are suspicious for malignancy that should proceed directly to a GYN oncologist, and those that are indeterminate. In the indeterminate mass, several rec second step recommendations were made, but referral to an expert, to an expert sonographer, was high on that list of options, or potentially use of second stage step testing. And the approach two that was suggested was utilizing risk prediction models with an emphasis on IOTA simple rules. So again, now you have the American College of OBGYN acknowledging the, the body of work that's been done by IOTA. And you have the American Institute of Ultrasound and Medicine saying there may be another approach to the evaluation of the adnexal mass. So I think you should be quite proud of all the work that you've done and to understand that we are going to change, we just may be a little slow with that. Other comments made by the consensus panel is that real-time assessment by experienced imagers is currently the most accurate for characterizing masses. And again, getting away from operating on all unilocular cysts in the postmenopausal patient, recognizing they're not precursors to malignant ovarian cancer. That ovarian lesions considered to be benign can be followed conservatively, especially with the aspects of fertility preservation being on the, the forefront these days. Or can, be, can go to surgery for indicated reasons by a general gynecologist. There is a question left open for discussion and future uh, future evaluation is, should postmenopausal women with endometriomas once they've completed menopause, go to surgery and benefit from um, removal in terms of risk for malignant conversion. And no consensus was made on that. Um, this was a paper recently published by Dr. Von Nagel and Dr. Miller, who was our former resident, that was a CME paper in the Green Journal on the treatment of ovarian masses. And it looked at what are low risk and high risk potential secondary tests and or ultrasound findings that would help you assess with that indeterminate mass. And I wanted to point out that the ADNIX model appears there for the first time is where I've seen it with the University of Kentucky CME paper. So in summary, <laughs> We are endeavoring for an American approach, a unified American approach, utilizing work that's been done by IOTA, the University of Kentucky, and guidelines and recommendations by ACOG and the American College of OB, uh, and the American Institute of Ultrasound and Medicine. That really it's education of the generalists and general radiology with regards to tumors being potentially very dynamic 
that morphology is key, patient characteristics and risk assessment are important so that we can get patients to those who are truly experts in the assessment of masses, get individuals with ovarian cancer into the hands of trained high volume G1 oncologists, stabilize or potentially even lower health care costs. $5 billion for treatment of adnexal masses in the United States is a lot of money. But most importantly, to reduce morbidity so that patients go to surgery who need it, that we conserve reproductive function when possible. So thank you. Misty, um, okay, do you want to grab a seat? Uh, Sean, where are you? Sean, Sean, hello, Sean. Hi, do you want to come up? But Dirk, come up. We're going to, just for a few moments, if I may, because I know we are short of time. Have you got um, a microphone? I just want to encourage, perhaps you, Dirk, I mean, we've heard some, Misty, are you going to join us on the, um, obviously we've heard the Belgian um, system, which, uh, I mean, there's a lot about management there, but that's a very structured, centralized, pretty organized approach, it seems to me, um, from what I can gather. Sean has sort of uh, presented a situation where um, what we might call a pragmatic approach, perhaps, to, to management in terms of saying, well, you know, there may be different ways, maybe better ways, but, you know, actually that's what we can deliver with the service we've got. Um, I think it's kind of fair to say. And then Misty has described a situation where there's a, there has been a fairly, what I have to, without being rude, slightly chaotic, but is now being rationalized and focused a bit with perhaps more of a free market approach, perhaps, as you might, um, to, to how people are handling this. So how, Dirk, I mean, did you have any thoughts about that when we were listening uh, and, and as, as, as the relative approaches uh, to, any, to, to the UK and the US, for example, since you've got both of these people here? Yes. Um, nice to put you on the spot, mate. <clears throat> Thank you. Um, well, listening to these lectures and uh, thinking back of the experience in the United States, we were surprised that there was such a resistance to take up models. And I think it's because the way uh, ultrasound is done by technicians and uh, physicians reading these scans, so that makes it a completely different situation. And people tend to uh, be more um, trustful to C125 and other markers uh, because it's easy. It's a lab result and it's an equivocal. It's easier to read than to read reports from technicians. So I think this is uh, part of the difference. Uh, but the main thing I think is uh, today this was more a research day. So presentation of what is the current position of research, what's the evidence, what are the guidelines. Tomorrow it will be more educational and then I think we can focus more on what is the future or what is the current thinking. And my thinking is at this moment that uh, the future is up next and maybe we don't need up next in every single case. Uh, so because the benign easy descriptors will say this is a union local assist without any irregular walls, this is benign. So you don't need any model. But when you need it, if you have some irregularities or some suspicious signs and you, you're really not uh, on top of uh, a diagnosis, then you, I think the most reliable model will prove to be up next. But we are a little bit too early to prove this. We have now external validation studies, but we need to have more evidence by systematic reviews. And then, I have no illusion, it will take a few years before guidelines will pick up. But in the meantime, there will be other markers, liquid biopsies, and so So there's always a, a upsetting lag time uh, in between research, evidence, and then guidelines and clinical care. I mean, Misty, what is it, I mean, the use of things like um, over, I never understood the use of over one, which is, is it such a non-specific test, isn't it? I mean, it's got a 50% specificity, roughly. So, but, you know, yes, you'll get everyone will go through to an oncology center, but half the population will as well. So, right. it's, so it's interesting, you've got FDA approval hard, almost ahead of almost anything else. Yeah, the FDA approved it. I could say that there wasn't much enthusiasm for routine use of it in the general population, only in research centers. Um, out of the University of Texas and then G mostly GYN oncology centers that are looking at its application. The concern largely in the United States was that, again, you're putting the assessment of these masses mostly in the hands of the generalist or general radiologist, and that each one of those tests 
at over one test is $650. So there's quite a financial driver, especially with Medicare yeah. patients, I presume. So there wasn't much enthusiasm in terms of guidelines of, of supporting over one at all. I mean, my thought about the Adnex model, having used it and played with it, is relatively easy, and that you have a whole generation of residents and fellows who are, are very tech savvy, that they will very quickly assimilate this. I've been using it when I'm teaching. In, here, let's have That's a That's interesting, because, I mean, you have sonographers, right? Or just residents. Who does the scanning? Uh, both. So when you, yep. if you said you have your sonographers and you say, right, here's Adnex, what's your feeling about, I mean, see, to, people always say, well, you know, these, these things are, you've got Lil or whoever, and these amazing people who can scan, it's so difficult. See, I look at it and say, well, these are features you should recognize anyway. If you can scan an ovary, you should recognize the features. But I accept I'm, I have that bias. But you, you're taking a, a relatively new test and teaching sonographers. What, what are they like at doing it, and what's their uptake? Uh, their uptake in learning is uh, actually quite quick when you start teaching them the very general features that you're looking for. And then when you, again, it's the indeterminate mass that's more difficult, but I find that's also where adnex becomes very important in terms of helping them differentiate masses that they should be concerned about, masses that can be observed. It's just, a, it's another important learning tool to help them with the triage, but they very readily will take up an app in terms of hand in hand with their learning about the ultrasonographic uh, ultra features. So can I just finally turn to Sean? I mean, do you think that if you pass it on, I mean, because I mean, you, you know where I'm coming to on this, and, I, and it's kind of uh, a reluctance. I always sense in the UK they're saying, well, you know, this is all a bit difficult, and you've got to be super specialist at scanning, and really it's kind of beyond. But in my view is, and you've got, I know, certainly Heather in the audience who's a, so not, hello, Heather. Um, I don't think she would say, you know, you have, I think it's always, Sonographers sometimes get trained difficultly, but they're often exceptionally skilled and very experienced, often more than doctors, more than capable of, uh, of, of recognizing these features if they're taught properly. Um, so to me, it seems to be more of a, look, if you're going to use this, get the training right and, and, and roll it out. Um, and I, I suppose that's my frustration. I don't yeah. know what your view is on that. I think the, the, the reality is, what I was trying to explain earlier, is that is very frustrating when you see something there and why this big organisation doesn't take it on. And what I was trying to explain, that incentivising the organisation to move ahead is where you go. Um, saying that people should do it, I understand. And, uh, I know, Tom, oh, yeah. for years you've been battling trying to get it done and can they not move ahead? And that is the frustration. So the organisation will go through a system whereby if you, this is where it's bad, is waiting for the organization to pick it up. When it does pick it up, you're sitting back then. So let's take IOTA, you know, let's take it next, whichever, it doesn't matter, the principle is the same, that if the evidence base comes out, a nice tick, tick the box, people will move on it and they will move quickly on it. The problem is the gap between that time of having the evidence. Dick, I, 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 Dick, I can understand your frustration, maybe something new will come out, but Hell, we've had that in medicine all the time. You just keep proceeding. Don't worry about new markers, it's unlikely. But the game of the ovarian masses is quite important because the principles of medicine is first do no harm. And what we have been doing, in fact, is finding out these cysts, endometriomas taken out because they might become torn. We all did this stuff before. And this is a very important aspect of a base principle of healthcare from at least you know, a medical viewpoint is having a system to stop us operating on women, we're getting there, who do not need the operations. And the more we can push with that, any health service that ignores the validity of that, I think is missing the whole point of what health's about. Because essentially, we've driven it that way to some extent, not on purpose, but we have. And this is the way, these are the important areas to try and redress that. Because there's a lot of women undergoing unnecessary operations. They went in because of a slight back pain, they end up with an ovarian cyst, having a laparotomy and is all benign. I mean, I think Dirk's got, his, eye, Dirk's got his eyes on uh, one of those five billion dollars he is spending yeah. over there for his research, I think. <laughs> yeah, um, all of you, thank you very much. I think we're going to have to close because we're running late. Um, it's a very, very interesting session. Um, amazing how you can have different approaches in different countries based on the same evidence. It's interesting, isn't it? Um, okay, so... Um, I know we're all late, but there we are. Next, we're going to talk about something entirely different. Um, and I say that with some emphasis, because it's not the same thing as what we're doing with IOTA. Lil Valentin, 
Lil, uh, everyone I think probably knows Lil, but obviously she's uh, Professor in Malmo in Sweden, has been uh, one of the founders of the IOTA project. Um, and um, obviously screening of ovarian cancer is very seductive. Um, I started in ultrasound by running the King's College Hospital ovarian cancer screening project, and that was quite a painful experience, I have to say. Um, and if you look in England uh, or the UK, you know, people are marketing the rocket algorithm, doing blood tests to screen for ovarian cancer. In the States, it's been quite controversial, and I think been calls for that to be banned, I think, haven't there, in the States? And um, because it's been um, brought to market Is prematurely, and, and, yeah. and there's quite a lot of controversy over the results of the uh, randomized trial in the UK and the way that uh, statistics were done retrospectively and so on. So it's, it's, uh, it's a very old and yet slightly hot topic, if you like, and Lil's going to discuss this and I'm sure she'll come down one side or the other at some point. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you very much. It's nice to be here again. Um, I will talk about uh, ovarian cancer screening. So the idea of screening is that by detecting disease at an early asymptomatic stage and by instituting treatment at that early asymptomatic stage, prognosis can be improved. And it seems very rational to try to detect ovarian cancer at an early asymptomatic stage and to institute treatment at that early stage because the five-year survival of ovarian cancers diagnosed at stage one may be as high as 90%, while it is only 10 to 15% for ovarian cancers diagnosed at stage three. So the goal of ovarian cancer screening is to decrease ovarian cancer mortality. Does screening for ovarian cancer decrease ovarian cancer mortality? I will come back to that later. First, I want to give you a short background. Currently, there are three methods of screening for ovarian cancer. Ultrasound examination of the ovaries, blood sampling with analysis of CA125, or a combination of both, multimodal screening. From observational studies of screening for ovarian cancer with ultrasound in the general population, ultrasound screening seems to have a detection rate of ovarian cancer of 85% to 100% at one year of follow-up. However, a high detection rate is of value only if it is associated with a shift towards earlier stages at detection, and ultrasound screening does seem to cause a shift towards earlier stages at detection, with 60 to 75 percent of screen detected ovarian cancers being stage one or two, versus only 30 percent of those detected without screening. However, the fact that ultrasound screening does seem to cause a shift towards earlier stages at detection does not necessarily mean that prognosis is improved, and I will come back to that later. From observational screening studies using ultrasound, we also know that 5 to 10 percent of asymptomatic postmenopausal women screened for ovarian cancer using ultrasound have an abnormal ultrasound finding in their adnexa, and that 0.3% to 2% of them undergo surgery, and that there are 10 to 60 operations per screen detected ovarian cancer. Still, fewer than one in 2,000 screened women have ovarian cancer. And I think that from these numbers, all of you have figured out that for each screen-detected ovarian cancer, there is a price to be paid in terms of the harm caused by false positive screening results. Harm is caused by unnecessary anxiety, unnecessary follow-up examinations, and unnecessary surgery for benign screen-detected lesions surgery associated with morbidity and perhaps even mortality. Now a few words about screening for ovarian cancer using CA125. 
CI125 is a glycoprotein which is expressed by non mucinous epithelial ovarian cancers, but also by many other tissues in the body, which means that it is an unspecific marker of ovarian cancer. From observational um, studies on screening for ovarian cancer in the general population, using a single measurement of CA125, we know that approximately 80% of women with ovarian cancer have increased levels of CA125, but only 50% of women with ovarian cancer stage 1 have increased levels of CA125. So in this sense, ultrasound screening seems to be superior to screening for ovarian cancer using CA125 because ultrasound screening seems to have 80 to 100% detection rate of ovarian cancer stage 1. On the other hand, screening with CA125 is associated with a lower screen positive rate, a lower false positive rate, and therefore there are fewer operations per screen detected ovarian cancer. However, the screening performance of CA125 can be improved by serial measurements of CA125, trying to assess the change in CA125 over time. In women with ovarian cancer, CA125 levels increase over time, while in women who do not have ovarian cancer, CA125 levels remain stable or decrease over time. A sophisticated mathematical model has been developed to study the change in CA125 over time, and in a preliminary study in which serial measurements of CA125 were used to screen for ovarian cancer, the detection rate of serial measurements was 86% at a 2% false positive rate, while in the same study population, the detection rate of a single measurement of CA125 was only 62% at the same 2% false positive rate. In this preliminary study, it wasn't possible to estimate the detection rate of serial measurements of CA125 of ovarian cancer stage 1, because in this preliminary study, there were only five cases of ovarian cancer stage 1. Now, this sophisticated mathematical model of studying the change in CA125 over time has now been patented and is called the Risk of Ovarian Cancer Algorithm, ROCA. So this method is not available to any one of us. So now back to the crucial question. Does screening for ovarian cancer save lives? Now, some of you might want to argue and say that, of course it does, because I just told you that ultrasound screening for ovarian cancer causes a shift towards early stages at detection, and the prognosis for early stage ovarian cancer is much better than the prognosis for late stage ovarian cancer. However, as I have already said, the fact that screening seems to cause a shift towards earlier stages at detection does not necessarily mean that prognosis is improved. Why not? Because lead time bias and length time bias may explain apparently better survival, while in fact the time of death was not changed by screening. Lead time bias is explained here in the image to the left, Imagine a hypothetical case in which a cancer starts to grow in a woman when she's 45 years old and causes her death when she's 65 years old. If this cancer is detected at stage 1 when the woman is 52 years old, survival from diagnosis is 13 years. If instead the cancer is diagnosed at stage 3 when the woman is 61 years old, survival from diagnosis is only four years. In this case, the nine years difference in survival only represents the extra time that the disease process was known. So in this case, screening seemed to improve 
survival, but the time of death was not changed. And this is called lead time bias. Length time bias is explained here in the image to the right. Imagine four different individuals in whom a cancer starts to grow at 45 years of age. However, because the cancers grow at different rates, they cause the death of the individuals at different ages. And of course, in a screening program, the slowly growing cancers that have a good prognosis have many more opportunities of being detected at stage one than the slowly, than the fast growing cancers, because the fast growing cancers will have killed the woman before she comes to screening or will have reached an advanced stage before the woman comes to screening. So in any screening program for ovarian cancer, it is the slowly growing cancers with good prognosis that are the most likely one to be detected. And this is called length time bias. And it is because of lead time bias and length time bias that a possible benefit of screening for ovarian cancer can only be determined in a randomized controlled trial with ovarian cancer mortality as an endpoint. There are now two completed randomized controlled trials on ovarian cancer screening in the general population. The PLCO trial in the United States and the UK CTOX in the United Kingdom. Let's look at the PLCO trial first. In this trial, 78,000 women 55 to 74 years old were randomized either to a control group receiving no screening or to four annual scans using both ultrasound and a single measurement of CA125 followed by two subsequent annual scans using only a single measurement of CA125. In this trial, the women were followed up with regard to death from ovarian, tubal, and peritoneal cancer, and the median follow-up time was 12 years after randomization. In this trial, the planned primary mortality analysis was by a weighted log rank statistic. This statistic takes into account the delayed effect of screening on ovarian cancer mortality. In the PSCO trial, there was no effect of screening for ovarian cancer on ovarian cancer mortality. This figure here shows you the cumulative number of ovarian cancer deaths since randomization. In the screened group, which is the upper black line, and in the control group, the lower dotted line. So you can see here that in this trial, the ovarian cancer mortality was actually higher in the screen group than in the control group. But of course, this difference was not statistically significant. And in this trial, there was no shift towards earlier stages at detection. In the UK CTOX, 200,000 women were randomized, 100,000 women were randomized to a control group receiving no screening, and 100,000 women were randomized to six annual screens using either transvaginal ultrasound or serial measurements of CA125 using the patented mathematical model to study changes in CA125 over time the ROCA method. In this trial, the women were followed up with regard to death from ovarian and tubal cancer, and the median follow-up time was 11 years since randomization. In this trial, the planned primary mortality analysis was by a Cox proportional hazards model. This model does not take into account the delayed effect of screening on ovarian cancer mortality. 
The planned primary mortality analysis did not show any statistically significant mortality reduction in the screened groups compared to the control group. However, when the authors looked at the Kaplan-Meier curves, they saw that there seemed to be a delayed effect of screening on ovarian cancer mortality after approximately seven years in the CA125 screening arm and after approximately nine years in the ultrasound arm. So they decided to do two post hoc analyses using a weighted log rank test and a Royston Parma model. Both these statistical methods do take into account the delayed effect of screening on ovarian cancer mortality. And using the weighted log rank test, they found a 22% mortality reduction in the CA125 arm of the trial and a 20% mortality reduction in the ultrasound arm of the trial. But only the mortality reduction in the CA125 arm of the trial was statistically significant. So does this mean that do these results conclusively show that CA125 screening reduces ovarian cancer mortality and that screening with ultrasound does not? The answer is no, because the criteria for a trial to be confirmatory, that is the criteria for a trial to show conclusive results, is that the planned primary statistical analysis must yield a significant result. The fact that two post hoc tests did yield a statistically significant result doesn't change this. The problem with post hoc analysis is that they increase the risk of type 1 error. They increase the risk that there seems to be an effect, but in fact there is no effect. Um, in, the authors also, also did a pre-specified secondary analysis in the UK CTOX. They included death from peritoneal cancer in the ovarian cancer mortality, and then they did not find any statistically significant reduction in uh, ovarian cancer mortality in the screen groups. So if we sum up the PLCO trial and the UK CTOX, we find that the PLCO trial fi found no effect on ovarian cancer uh, mortality of screening. In the UK CTOX, the primary analysis showed no statistically significant effect of screening on ovarian cancer mortality, but two post hoc analyses are promising, but they are not conclusive. And if there is a mortality reduction, it is probably smaller than anticipated. So, we don't have any evidence yet that ovarian cancer screening is beneficial. So, in these trials, did screening cause any harm? In this table, I have summarized the harm of screening in terms of complications after surgery for a benign screen-detected lesion. In the PLCO trial, there were 10 benign surgeries per screen-detected ovarian cancer, and in this trial, the complication rate after benign surgery was very high, 15%, which means that in this trial, one in 200, 000, <laughs> one in 200 women screened were caused harm by being screened. And there is no evidence that anybody benefited from being screened. In the UK CTOX, there were, uh, in the uh, ultrasound arm of the UK CTOX, there were also 10 benign surgeries per screen detected um, ovarian cancer, but
but the complication rate was lower, 3.5% after benign surgery, which means that in the ultrasound arm of the UK CTOX, one in a thousand screened women were caused harmed by being uh, screened. In the CA125 arm of the UK CTOX, there were only two surgeries per screen detected ovarian cancer, and in this arm of the trial, the complication rate after benign surgery was 3.1%, which means that in the CA125 arm of the UK CTOX, one in 3,000 screened women was harmed by being screened. But we still don't have any conclusive evidence that any woman in the UK CTOX benefited from being screened. So, there is not enough evidence to introduce general ovarian cancer screening using either ultrasound or CA125. There is not enough evidence to offer opportunistic ovarian cancer screening using either ultrasound or CA125. And in fact, the FDA in the United States recommends against using screening for ovarian cancer. So what is the effect of this warning? Well, the effect is that the availability of the ROCA test in the United Kingdom has been temporarily limited. I went to the ROCA website on the 28th of January and I could no longer find a list of gynecologists in the United Kingdom offering the ROCA test, and it doesn't <coughs> seem to be possible any longer for any woman to buy the ROCA test on the internet. So to sum up, we do not have any conclusive evidence that screening for ovarian cancer in the general population decreases ovarian cancer mortality. The UK CTOX results are promising, but they are not conclusive. False positive screening results cause harm in terms of complications after surgery for benign screen detected lesions. I speculate, but maybe it shouldn't be in my conclusions, but my speculation is that the harm caused by screening can probably be minimized by expert second opinion ultrasound, excluding malignancy, in screen detected and nexal masses. In none of these trials was expert ultrasound examination performed uh, as second opinion. We are currently awaited, awaiting extended follow-up of the women in the UK CTOX. The principal investigators of this trial have decided to follow up all the women in the UK CTOX until the 31st of December 2018, and they hope that in this extended follow-up, they will be able to show um, a, a, a mortality reduction of ovarian cancer screening. Thank you very much for your attention. <clears throat> uh, thank you, Bill, uh, for, as ever, forensic analysis of the evidence um, on ovarian cancer screening. Um, any views? We have a varied audience from many countries. Any, any comments? I mean, interesting, in the ultrasound arm, I always felt, I mean, that taking away the mortality reduction um, was the sort of lack of a second stage test to reduce the false positive rate in the ultrasound arm. If you think, if, you know, if you, if, when, you, when you actually look at the study, yeah. they, they, they never really tried to make any attempt to reduce the number of false positive test results in the ultrasound arm. No, I don't think the level of expertise, no. so called second stage, it was not very high. So I think that explains the very high intervention rate. But that's, uh, yeah, that's yeah. what I mean. So it was almost, it was inevitably not going to work very well in terms of yeah, that yeah, side of the yeah. test performance, mm. um, it seems to me. Any other queries? Or, there's a point at the front. Could you have a mic microphone to the front, please, if there is one? I don't know where they are. Do you want to come up here and just speak into here?
Here you go. Look. Just <laughs> I think it works, okay? <laughs> It's just that you look kind of ridiculous speaking into a yellow box, I have to say. I can do you, yes. Um, I have a question. Uh, if we consider the two types uh, of ovarian carcinomas, uh, that yes. is uh, endometrial or grave endometrioid, mucinous, uh, clear cell, and low-grade serous carcinoma, do you think that the screening uh, can work or not? Um, because you, probably high grade serous carcinoma doesn't work because high grade serous carcinoma uh, is uh, really aggressive. Yes, I think, well, with the current knowledge that we have, it seems very difficult to detect at an early stage uh, type 2 ovarian cancer, which we think originate in the tube and the cells are spread all over the place and suddenly it's a very advanced disease. I don't think that ultrasound will ever be able to detect that type of cancer, possibly some kind of serum marker or plasma marker. Uh, but I think we have a good chance of detecting the, uh, the type 1 ovarian cancers. But they do not have a very big effect on mortality, I don't think. Okay, Lou, I think we, as yep. you know, we haven't, I haven't done very well as your chairman, keeping to time, because I'll have to cut short there. Thank you very much indeed. Um, and now today, round of applause for Lil. Come on. And now finally, Durella. Um, we have Durella Frankie, um, who's our last speaker. Um, and I think it's a really interesting topic, this, uh, the idea of... Um, the ultrasound diagnosis, and then the longitudinal follow-up of recurrences after people have had conservative surgery for borderline ovarian tumours. I mean, a few years ago, this isn't a topic that should have appeared in, in a conference very much, because I think these people will often have their tumour completely removed. But um, increasingly, I think we're seeing people who are having one or two or even three interventions sometimes for these types of cysts. Uh, and uh, it's increasingly acceptable just to follow them up. So I think it's a very interesting topic, actually. So um, how are your slides, Dorella? Are they, are they, are we going to work? Okay, can we start? Morning, everybody. Fabulous. Over to you. Um, thank you very much for inviting me here to present our uh, study. Uh, according to the diagnosis and uh, uh, follow-up or recurrences after conservative surgery in borderline ovarian tumor. Borderline ovarian tumors are tumors with a very good prognosis. They represent 10-15% of all ovarian tumors. They present in the 50-80% of the cases when they are at stage 1. Uh, the 35% of those patients have less than 40 years. And it's 99, the five-year-old survival in stage one disease, 80, 85 to 92, five years overall survival, or stages higher than one. But uh, uh, given the good prognosis of this uh, tumor, a conservative surgery in borderline ovarian tumors is an appropriate treatment for younger women who wish to preserve their fertility. What is conservative uh, treatment? Uh, this means the removal of the agnexal tumor with the preservation of the remaining genital apparatus in order to preserve the reproductive and the endocrine function. Of course, a comprehensive staging is always performed. But the problem is that when we perform a conservative surgery, of course, we have to take into account the risk of recurrence of the disease. The recurrence rate after a radical surgery is from 0 to 5 percent, as reported in the literature. But in case of conservative treatment, we can have a risk of recurrence from 10 to 30 percent of the cases. In particular, after a forectomy, the risk of recurrence is between 0 to 20 percent. But in case of cystectomy, the risk is even higher, from 12 to 58 percent with a relative risk of 5.4 in case of stage 2 and 3 disease. Prognostic factors for recurrence are invasive implants with 66% of overall survival versus 95%. The presence of micropapillar architecture, which is associated in the 45% of the cases with invasive implants. 
the microinvasion, the stage, the post P residual tumor, or the histotype. But we know that anyway, uh, surgery, a time of relapse, can still be curative in most cases. And the most important and the most effective tool to follow up those patients after conservative surgery is transvaginal ultrasound, and not only to follow them up, but also to detect foreign relapses. We suggest to follow up those patients every three months for the first two years and every six months thereafter for all their life, because in the literature we have seen that there are recurrences after many years uh, from the first the surgical procedure. And transvaginal ultrasound can correctly detect all variant recurrences. We have published a paper for the IOTA group where we described the morphology of recurrences. And usually, um, borderline recurrences display the same feature of the primary tumor. In particular, we had more serious borderline recurrences, 62 out of 68 patients. And in the most of the cases, we had unilocal or solid cyst in the 79% of the cases, or partly locular solid cyst. What we can see is that in the 95% of the cases, we had the presence of papillary projection. In one third of the cases, we did not observe, push this way. We did not observe any vascularization in the papillary projection. But in 23% of the cases, we had a minimal vascularization. In the 39% of the cases, a moderate vascularization. What is interesting is that in almost all the cases, the ultrasound examiner was confident with the diagnosis of a borderline tumor recurrence, except in three cases. In one case, it was misinterpreted as an endometrioma. In one case, as a primary invasive tumor and in one case of intestinal type has a benign disease. This is a typical aspect of a borderline recurrence. A unilocular solid cyst with a papillary projection with regular and thin walls. And the same characteristic are present also when we diagnose a very small lesion like this one, a unilocular solid cyst with a small papillary projection. As I showed you before, in two-thirds of the cases, we can observe the presence of a vascular tree, which is usually a very simple vessel within the papillary projection that can be visualized also in very small papillary projection. Sometimes, uh, very rarely, we can have also solid lesion. These solid lesion are uh, due to the presence of a huge amount of papillary projection that fill the whole volume of the cyst. And again, we can recognize them uh, using the, um, by visualizing this simple vascular tree. Sometimes we can also have the presence of multifocal lesion, like in this case. It is not very well known which is the origin of this multifocal lesion. There are two hypotheses, probably the, uh, the fact that during the first surgery some tissue was left, but the uh, most... Uh, um, reliable hypothesis is that the borderline disease is a multifocal disease. Sometimes we have observed also the presence of multifocal lesion also in the primary tumor. Or we can have in the 13% of the cases also the presence of multilocular solid lesion. Rarely we can have also the recurrence of borderline tumor in the form of invasive tumor. In the early stage this risk is less than 1% with an absolute rate from 2 to 4% of the cases, but usually they are low-grade carcinomas and very rarely high-grade carcinomas. Here is a case of a very young patient. We removed that first surgery, one ovary. Well, unfortunately, we lost her to the follow-up, and she came back 12 months later with this multilocular solid cyst, very well vascularized. We had to decide to remove this ovary, and the final pathology was a focal grade one disease in a prevalent borderline tumor. But a question a few years ago raised, is it really always necessary to perform surgery at time of relapse or of, of, of the relapse diagnosis, or can we follow them? 
If we follow regularly the patients with a conservative treatment, we can find very small lesion, very small recurrences, NKs in the variant parenchyma, and we can't find them at laparoscopy. And again, we have the necessity to preserve the ovarian parenchyma. So what can we do? I tell you why. This was a young patient again. Uh, we observed the presence of this recurrence uh, of 18 millimeter. The gynecologist decided to remove this very small recurrence because at the first surgery she had a borderline, serious borderline tumors with micro invasion, and he was aware, he was worried about that. But six months later, again, the same patient arrived with another ulinocular solid cyst uh, with papillary projection that were vascularized. I was not so sure that it was a new recurrence, so in a very short time. So I went back looking at the video of the first recurrence. And I observed on the, this was the recurrence, on the other side of the ovary, the presence of this very, very small solid lesion. And this was a very small lesion of five millimeter. And this was the second recurrence, but this is not a recurrence, we left it there. If you would have waited three or six months, probably we would have visualized the second lesion and we could have removed both together, uh, preserving the patient from two different uh, surgical procedures. Again, another case. Uh, in this case, this patient was enrolled for our follow-up study. She was diagnosed with a very small recurrence, but when I saw her three months later, as you can see here, there was another lesion but what was important that it was not noticed during the first, uh, the, the first ultrasound, there was a solid tissue on the surface of the ovary. So this means that when we select a patient, we must be very aware of uh, the type of, uh, of uh, recurrence that we select for the follow-up. So uh, we recently published the results of our study the aim of the study was the evaluation of the behavior and growth rate in recurrent borderline ovarian tumor in order to define the right timing for a further fertility sparing surgery in young patients. We enrolled 34 patients with 39 recurrences because in five patients we followed two consecutive recurrences. The mean age was 29. In the most of the cases, there were zero borderline tumors, 94% of the cases at the primary tumor. These were the stages at the primary tumor. In the 30% of the cases, there were stage one. In the most of the cases, there were stage two and three without invasive implants, and four patients also with invasive implants. In the most of the cases, again, we had unilocular solid cyst, and we decided to categorize the cyst into four groups. Uh, I'll show you later that there were then three groups we call because in the third group there were only three patients according to the cyst size at entry study. Uh, in the most of the cases we had just one papillary projection but we could have also two or more. And uh, <clears throat> according to cyst, I'm um, sorry, uh, okay. <laughs> the time, the follow-up time was 9.8 months. Um, in uh, the 40% of the patients, they were at their first recurrence, 43% they were at their second recurrence, but we had also patients that were at their third or even fourth recurrence. Uh, in the most of the cases, we followed uh, uh, just one recurrence, uh, one single cyst in uh, the same ovary, but also we could have two or more cysts in the same or in the contralateral ovary. All those recurrences underwent a further surgical procedure, which was, um, in the 19% of the cases, a further conservative surgery. In the 66% of the cases, unilateral cystectomy. In the 12% of the, in the, yes, 12 of the cases, a bilateral cystectomy. 10% of the cases, a unilateral orthorectomy. But what we can see, I told you that we categorized the cyst according to the cyst I mentioned at entry study into three different groups. And we can see that in each group, in the first group, we considered the cyst less than one centimeter, from one to two centimeter, more than three centimeter. 
we can see that in each group, the cysts behave and grow in a different way. We can have cysts that tend to grow very quickly and cysts that tend to grow very slowly. We calculated also a mean growth rate, but we shouldn't keep this into consideration because you are seeing that there are different growth rates inside, uh, inside the same group. This is just a case that I wanted to show you. This was a very young patient that we diagnosed a father a recurrent cyst. This was our fourth recurrence, so we decided to follow the harp. And the cyst, when, we, uh, when it was diagnosed, it was only seven millimeters in diameter. Just I show you some images of the many images that we collected for this patient. And the cyst arrived from seven millimeter to 24 millimeter in five years. So very slow growth rate. But another case, for example, this patient, we diagnosed the recurrence when it was 10 millimeter in diameter. And uh, this recurrence grew up to 35 millimeter just in one year. So different behavior, different growth rate. What we observed by categorizing the cyst into the three groups was that in any groups anyway, the cyst tended to grow during time. But what is interesting is that the growth rate, apart from this first six months of the third group, tend to decrease during time. So we also calculated, and this is very interesting, the probability of each cyst to sojourn in the same growth rate at each interval time. And we have seen that for the smaller cyst, after 12 months, only the 26% of the cyst sojourn in the same growth rate, while in the other two groups at 12 months, almost more or less the 50% of the cyst sojourn in the same growth rate. This was probably due to the fact that the, the mean diameter of the smaller cyst was very close to the upper limit, closer than the, the mean distance to the upper limit for the second group or for the, for the third group. So even if the higher, the bigger cyst tend to grow faster than the smaller cyst, they have much distance to run before arriving to the, to the upper limit. And what does it mean? This means that cysts that during the follow-up period remain within the same curve, may be followed up for a more delayed interval schedule and for a longer period of time. But cysts that move from one to the next growth curve require a closer follow-up as they reach the surgical cutoff limit of 40 millimeter, which is uh, the cutoff that we consider has the limit to remove anyway this uh, recurrence uh, earlier. And since uh, the 50% of both recurrences remain within the same uh, growth curve during the first year of follow-up, it seems reasonable and safe to delay the surgical intervention and to widen the follow-up after very final course that they do not display a fast growth rate. We also estimated the time for a borderline cyst to get to four centimeter, which is the cutoff point. And 10 cysts arrived to four centimeter in 43. 0.5 months. As those that were the indication for the far fertility sparing surgery in recurrent borderline tumor, such as the cyst size of equal or more than 40 millimeter, the doubling of tumor dimension in three months, the high growth rate, also patient related, such as the desire of pregnancy, high tumor marker, or also we have to take into consideration the patient request due to subjective anxiety. So to conclude, if we see a very small recurrence encased in the ovarian parenchyma, we can wait and we can treat it when it's big enough to remove it safely without damaging the surrounding parenchyma. The final goal of such a management is to minimize the impact on fertility potential of these young women without worsening their prognosis. I told you before that all those patients underwent a further surgical procedure, and in any case, we observed the progression of their disease to invasive lesions. And given the low growth rate of borderline tumors recurrences in selected cases, an observation of follow-up may be considered in order to define the optimal time of a further conservative surgical approach. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you.
Mr. Rather, thank you. Thank you very much indeed for that. Um, any questions about borderline tumors and their follow-up? So where, where does the four centimeter magic cutoff come from? <laughs> this was an arbitrary decision. We decided not to uh, leave those cysts to grow more, more because we have to preserve, of course, the ovarian parenchyma. And if you wait for a bigger cyst, maybe you have to remove more yeah. normal ovarian parenchyma. So we decided for That's that size. That's common sense. And is there anything different about the ones that grow faster and double faster? Is there anything inherent about their behavior or what happens in terms of their future prognosis? Or are they just faster growing? I mean, is the only thing that matters the fact they get to that size bigger? Or is there anything else about those particular tumors? We, we don't know why do they uh, grow. We performed a univariate and multivariate analysis also about that. And we observed that, that only the time, the passing of the time, the size at uh, the initial observation and also the micropapillary aspect influenced the cyst growth rate, but uh, anything else was uh, significant uh, in the speed of growth rate. We do not know why they behave in this different way. We just have to follow them. Okay, Jorda, thank you very much indeed. Thanks very much. Now, According to, as chairman, according to my program, there's nothing that says we're going to sit Anne in front of a big cardboard box. So I'm not sure what's happening now. The boot exhibition. Ah, so we now have a, a prize winning draw. There's a prize winning. So now, um, it's up to you. We selected the uh, completed forms. She looked in the box. I just saw it. So it's from Poland. Um, Pietriga Marek. <laughs> what is it? You get a Samsung Gear Fit too. Right. Okay. You weren't selected because they thought you needed to do more training. Don't worry. It wasn't that reason. Um, is that it? Nervous. OK, fine. So um, I'm sorry it ran a little bit late. Um, I want to thank all the speakers for a really interesting day and all of you for sticking with it until the last minute. Um, as you know, um, it's now a reception, drinks, which is uh, outside. So have a drink, mingle, look at the exhibitions. And um, we have the same format tomorrow at 8 o'clock. We have individual uh, small group discussions. And then the main conference starts in here at 9 o'clock. So have a great evening and see you tomorrow. So first, uh, first day already finished. Uh, and I hope yes. the lecture was uh, uh, where uh, informative and clinical, uh, clinically uh, valuable for of you. Course. So we close the, um, the live streaming today. So see you tomorrow at 9.15. And thanks. Goodbye.